Now, Donald Trump is persecuting even more whistleblowers under his regime. One of these whistleblowers is a, uh, someone by the name of Daniel Everett Hale. A former U.S. intelligence analyst was arrested Thursday and charged with violating the Espionage Act for allegedly leaking documents about the secretive U.S. drone program. 31-year-old Daniel Hale was arrested in Nashville, Tennessee. He faces up to 50 years in prison. Hale was enlisted in the Air Force from 2009 to 2013, during which he worked with the National Security Agency and the Joint Special Operations Task Force at the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, where he helped identify targets to be assassinated. He later worked as a contractor for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Hale's accused of disclosing 11 top secret or secret documents to a reporter. The indictment does not name the reporter, but unnamed government sources have told media outlets the reporter is investigative journalist Jeremy Scahill of The Intercept. Now, in 2015, The Intercept did put out a series of stories called The Drone Papers, which outlined how the Obama administration was using inaccurate technology and kill lists to take out people they considered, quote unquote, dangerous. Um, what we've published uh, is an extensive uh, look into how this program has operated historically, but specifically under President Obama. One of the most significant uh, uh, findings of this, and my colleague Cora Courier really dug deep into this, um, is we published for the first time the kill chain, what the bureaucracy of assassination looks like. And what you see is that um, all of these officials, including people like the Treasury Secretary, are part of uh, signing off on all of this, uh, at where they have these secret meetings, uh, and they discuss who's going to live and die around the world. And at the end of that process, it is the president of the United States who signs what, what amounts to a uh, death warrant uh, for whoever they've decided should die based on what amounts to a parallel secret uh, judicial system in the United States that is not really subjected to any kind of judicial review, where the president acts sort of as emperor, issues an edict that you die. And what we show, and, and this is the first time that, that there's documentary evidence of this, is that the president gives the military a 60-day window to hunt down and kill these individuals. Uh, Ken Roth from Human Rights Watch uh, pointed out today, if the standard is that the people who are uh, being targeted uh, for assassination uh, is that they represent an imminent threat, which is what the president says the U.S. policy is, uh, then why do they have 60 days to do it? Why don't they need to do it now if it's imminent? Well, that's because they've redefined the term imminent uh, to, to, to be so vague as to not even resemble its actual commonly understood definition. So here's the thing. When I was in high school, <clears throat> a girl that had a crush on me put me on a kill list when I didn't reciprocate those feelings. I was number four, which, let's be honest, hurt, that hurt. Number four? <laughs> number four, I, I, I wasn't even in the top three? Come on, what the fuck? Right, it must have not been that great of a crush. But look, the school administrators found out about it and they suspended her from school and ensured that she got psychiatric care. When a 15 year old has a kill list, she's removed from society. When a president has one, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I, don't, I think that's not just an insult to what the prize represents, but all of the words in Nobel Peace <laughs> Prize. <laughs> Hale was arrested and indicted for revealing information to a journalist and currently faces 50 years in prison. You know who's facing zero years in prison? All of the people that had a fucking kill list and used million dollar drones to rain death from the skies. By the way, uh, Death from the Skies is also the title of the newest Steven Seagal film that's going right to VHS. It's just... Very, very exciting. He is still alive, uh, you guys. <laughs> Just wanted to let everybody know. <laughs> but look, the, the Espionage Act protects real sociopaths and murderers, but ensures the people who had a conscience about, the, about their misdeeds face a lifetime in prison.
All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the program. Thank you for hanging out with us. Got some folks over on the Rockfin. We got some folks over on Odyssey and Facebook. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much for uh, updating the account. I appreciate that uh, to to receive U.S. dollar tips on Odyssey. That's very cool. It's, uh, that's awesome. I appreciate that. I will definitely uh, set those things up. Uh, very kind of you guys to do that. Uh, over on Rockfin, you guys can leave tips over here. You guys can leave tips on the old Odyssey. Uh, there's a, a link to the donation page on my website as well. Uh, today's been a little bit of a, a weird, stressful scatterbrain day, to be honest. Um, nothing of like, you know, I, I've just been trying to ca get caught up on all the stupid paperwork shit for health insurance and, and trying to sort out everything with my car. So uh yeah and and a lot of things are kind of in limbo um like trying to figure out whether my i'm gonna get to keep my health insurance this year the way that it is or if i need to like figure out some alternative plan remains to be in limbo uh to figure out what's going on with the credit union that i have put in an application for to refinance my loan so that i'm not with the hyper predatory company is also in limbo so that that kind of stuff stresses you out a little bit uh so i'm trying to do my best to just keep above the stress uh so yeah it's been it's been a, it's been one of those kind of kind of days uh and i'm not a huge uh I, i'm not a huge fan of it but i gotta like get through it you know um the credit union has been like they're like hey we got your application things haven't really moved forward you, you know the loan officer has looked at it um they've gone over all your information it's just a matter of getting you know approval or not approval and that comes from the next step yada 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 and it's just like it's been two weeks and my what i'm thinking is based on how much i know that these banks are fucking over people i bet a lot of people are switching over to credit unions um i wouldn't be surprised if that's the case um i wouldn't be surprised if a ton of people are just heading over to credit unions to fucking not deal with these 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 fraudsters and hucksters uh, uh you know in in the banking industry um and i've got i've got somebody trying to help with the with the citizens one situation um we'll we'll see how that pans out uh so yeah and, and then i'm 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 eventually going to do grandma wood show we had to reschedule cuz of some scheduling conflicts last night so um, I'm trying to get more, you know, people to kind of talk about this and cover this because I don't think the general populace truly understands how vicious and predatory these these banks really are, um, you know, and 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 what they're doing uh, and, and how they're creating more of a problem like they're they're going to create uh, a large number of homeless people with evictions with car repossessions you know um and uh and they're not very understanding of a lot of people's financial situations and then they offer these sort of stopgap measures that aren't particularly really even stopgap measures like you know oh defer your loan but by the way you'll have to pay interest on top of interest by the way it'll also mean that the, your last three to six payments will be unaffordable because, you know, most people, I don't know if they can make double payments and shit like that. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, it's like at the end of, end of your loan, you're making double payments and, you know, you're almost done paying off your car. You're almost done paying off your house or what have you. And it's going to get repossessed or foreclosed because you can't make the last couple payments. How, how helpful is that? You know, so those are kind of the stresses of that. Uh, but anyway, I, I think that that's sort of the little check-in up at the top of the show. Uh, you guys know the deal. I encourage you guys to leave comments. If you do leave comments, I will get to them at the very end of each segment so I don't get lost and super ranty uh, to kind of stay on, uh, stay on point to stay where we're going. Um, and, uh, and we got three pretty big and important stories to cover. So let's get right to it. So our first story, uh, if you if you watch the little 
preamble video to these live streams, I, I always try to have uh, a stand up clip or something from from my stand up catalog, uh, which includes the virtual shows and the forkful of noodles stuff. Um, you know, about a particular topic. So Daniel Everett Hale is is that topic for 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 today. And you guys heard uh, he is a whistleblower that revealed the uh, homicidal and murderous drone program. Um, and he had a crisis of conscience. So Daniel Everett Hale released the drone papers to The Intercept. And I remember this, you know, uh, Amy Goodman, when she reported it, kind of it was it was weird the way she reported it. Um, and I didn't want to get too hung up on that when I did the show, but you know we're we're doing a a, a loose fun live stream, so fuck it. Well, let let's go down this rabbit hole for a second. She says that you know the the journalist was not um, revealed. The who 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 Daniel Everett Hale revealed it, you know the the leaked documents to, uh, which included the kill chain, um, you know, kind of the bureaucracy of assassinations, uh, and. They're like, oh, well, he didn't reveal the journalist, but later it was found out that it was the Intercept's Jeremy Scahill, who, you know, then wrote the the drone papers, which was which was four or five different articles uh, that basically outlined what what uh, Hale revealed, which was the the kill chain, which was the inaccuracy of the drone program, um, how how they kill people, they don't really tell you, you know, who your targets are and things like that. Uh, and he had a crisis of conscience. He was working on this and he had a crisis of conscience, um, about not knowing who he was killing and, and whether or not he was killing civilians or not. And he couldn't really go through with it anymore. So he revealed the program. Now in the intercept articles, the initial intercept articles that came out in, I, I want to say 2015, 2016, sometime around there. Um, and I did a whole video about it the the, the week that it came out because it was kind of big news um, talking about how we have a war on whistleblowers and, you know, uh, how America doesn't – its policy is kill the messenger. America has a kill the messenger policy. Uh, rather than putting the war criminals in prison and what these leaks revealed, uh, they go ahead and punish the leaker anyway. That's America's policy. And it's convinced the rest of the world to fucking do that anyway to, as well. In the article, they did not reveal who their sources were, which I know that's not a thing for The Intercept anymore. Um, but in the article, they referred to him as, I, I think they referred to him as the whistleblower or, or, or something like that. They kind of give him a little code name um, because he didn't want to come forward. Why? And a lot of people chastised him for it is, well, why aren't you revealing the name of the fucking source? Like, why aren't you revealing the name of the, the leaker? What have you? And it's because... Look at what they're doing to him now. He came forward and they are trying to put him behind bars for 50 years. So why would he initially come forward? He revealed all this information. He, you know, he he was part of the United States Air Force and he was privy to this stuff. But if if the if the conclusion is that you're going to wind up in prison for the rest of your life, for revealing how murderous and inaccurate this drone program is that everybody was kind of praising. Why would you come forward? You, you, your whole life would be wrecked, you know? So I don't blame any whistleblower for, for not wanting to come out and, you know, exposing themselves because the United States government will retaliate against you in the worst possible fucking way. So, you know, one of the things he revealed was in, in 2012, 2013, he, um, he revealed that in Afghanistan, over 200 people were killed, or roughly 200 people were killed. And only about 35 of them were intended targets. That's a less than 20% accuracy. Less than 20%. But yeah, Daniel Everett Hale is the problem. Not the Obama administration that approved the program 
that killed 200 people. 35 of those were the targets that need, that, that America was going after, I guess. They have a less than 20% accuracy. But yes, Danny Everett Hale is the problem for revealing this information to the American public. The American public is often propagandized into supporting warfare, into supporting invasions, into supporting coups. You see that with, with you, well, we saw that with Iraq. You've seen that with Syria. You've seen that with Iran. We've seen that with Venezuela. We've seen that with Cuba. We've seen that with Nicaragua. We've seen that with Honduras. We've seen that with Bolivia. I mean, the list goes on and on. Where they perpetrate some kind of war, they perpetrate some kind of military action, and then when it turns south, they bail, the situation gets worse, they need to get more resources, and they need an excuse to go to war. So they propagandize the American people. Most people don't want to go to war. Because it's a, it's a waste. It's a total waste. Especially when you see what the cost of war is. The human life. The cost of human life that war takes, the environmental effects that war takes. And then when soldiers come home, you know, the United States military can't bother to fucking take care of them. And when soldiers have the 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 the, the balls and the guts to say what the United States is doing is wrong, they imprison those soldiers. Or they exile them, as in the case of Edward Snowden. Or they torture them. Well, I mean, Julian Assange isn't a soldier, but he is being tortured by the United States. Um, period. Now, the the drone missiles that have been upgraded, and and there's variants of these and things and things of that sort. Like one of the variants that they talk about in the article I read was, you know, it can like pierce through metal plates. So if you're in a reinforced bunker, it can go through that. You know, the missiles that these drones launch can go through that. Um, there's one that releases six-inch blades, spinning blades as it approaches targets. So now you're maiming and killing people that aren't your intended target. Like, that's what that's designed for. And they'll do the same thing, right? They'll use the same excuse that Israel uses. Oh, it's collateral damage. Oh, oh, well, you know, what are we supposed to do when they have human shields? I I've said this once, I'll say it again. Fucking don't kill human shields. If you're going to claim you're the good guy, just don't fucking kill human shields. It's really not that hard. Watch me not kill human shields the entire live stream. Watch me do that. It's really not that hard. And you got to ask, like, why is this necessary, right? Like, if these drones are so precise and the technology in them is so fucking good, why do you need spinning blades in your missiles? <laughs> Which sounds like it was, like, cooked up by a fucking Bond villain. Why do you need this? It's because they're fine with killing civilians, especially civilians that are not white. Most of the countries that they go after are are not just not not just used to be socialist or communist, but they're also brown. They're also resource rich. And, you know, this is a country that was built out of white supremacy. So those philosophies are ingrained in what the people of this country do and how the government propagandizes its people. The politicians can come out and sit there and say that they're against racism all day and long, but when they act, when their actions and their policies essentially dehumanize an entire group of people, an entire country full of people, it doesn't matter how many tweets or platitudes you say, well, racism is bad. Your actions are showing the, uh, you know, otherwise. It was, it, I mean, that, that was the one thing that I don't think liberals in this country really understood 
especially after Obama, is like, no, racism is still alive and well. It's systemic. And it's perpetrated by the government. Henceforth, the people kind of follow along with that. So if you want to reject racism, you have to reject the way the American government operates. You can't make excuses because it's your favorite politician or your favorite party. The other question you got to ask about these these fucking spinning blocks, how is this permitted? How is this fucking legal? How is the how is the Geneva Conventions not come down and been like you can't fucking put spinning blades on missiles, guys? That's crazy pants. How is this okay? And knowing this, how are drone operators still working with the military? You have a less than 20% chance of hitting your target. Not just that, it's at this point guaranteed that collateral damage is going to happen. How uh, you, you can't convince drone operators that this is okay. There's a great song by Thrice on their album To Be Everywhere Is To Be Nowhere. I think or to be nowhere is to be everywhere. One of the two. It's from 2017. A few years after Daniel Everett Hale. And he expresses uh, in, in one of their songs. That, I think it's called uh, it's called Drone, maybe. I can't remember the exact title of the, of the song, uh, which I apologize for. It's a great album. It's one of the only anti-war albums that has that I know of in this generation. Maybe I'm wrong. If, if I am, you know, I encourage you guys to leave uh, a comment. But it's a, it's, it basically expresses exactly what Daniel Everett Hale talks about he he just couldn't sit with it knowing that i'm killing innocent civilians or not knowing that i'm you know i don't i don't know these targets are just they're blinking lights it's like a video game they gamified war so currently um he's facing 50 years under the espionage act for leaking information to american journalists right and the espionage act is is um uh, specifically was well it was written to demonize and attack socialists anti-war socialists and communists in this in, in in the early 1900s um but you know specifically it was saying like it's it's in in 1917 it equalized the fact that you were an anti-war socialist to someone that was selling military secrets to the enemy that's kind of what they equated it with and this and this is no different they're saying, well, he leaked confidential information to the enemy is what they're claiming. So by Daniel Everett Hale re revealing this information to American journalists, the United States government trying him under the Espionage Act by saying that he revealed it to the enemies basically shows that the American military regards j American journalists as the enemy. Anybody that prints information that is that is counter to what the, the intelligence community and the military wants is officially the enemy. Now, obviously, things like CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, M uh, NPR, PBS, th these are not the enemy. These are, these are quote, news organizations, which I'm, I'm using that in quotes and I'm using that term very loosely, uh, that follow what these intelligence agencies want you to say. They're not going to release things like the drone papers. They're not going to release things like what Edward Snowden revealed about the NSA. What they do is, you know, even in the interviews that they did with, with Snowden on fresh air and whatever the fuck else program um, that they invited him on is that they ask him questions, silly questions like, well, why not come back to America? You know, face the music. It's like, no, you're not going to face it. They're not going to get a legal trial. They're going to get a sentencing. That's what's happening to Daniel Hale. At the end of this month, he's going to get sentenced. There's no trial for him. This is not how democracies operate. Democracies don't look at journalists that reveal horrific homicidal secrets about the American military as enemies. That's not how journalism operates. That's not how uh, democracies operate, rather. This is how military dictatorships operate. When, when it's revealed that your military is, 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 is doing illegal things and killing people killing civilians 
and claiming them as as collateral damage that's not okay and that's not how democracies work democracies don't indiscriminately kill people civilians journalists medics they don't they don't kill those kinds of people and say that it's collateral damage that this is how military dictatorships operate oh you're saying something counter to what we want people to believe kill that that's mil that's military dictatorships that's that's the real that's the reality of this situation with daniel hale is that's what he, he revealed that we're not living under a democracy If this was a true democracy, if this was an actual fucking democracy and some this information got leaked and was released to the public uh, by journalists, there would be an investigation opened up on the Obama administration, on the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration about why they use drone warfare, why they are using weapons and missiles with the six-inch spinning blades and that can cut through metal and all this other stuff and why they have a less than 20 percent accuracy rate and why they feel like that's okay to do what this case is is it's not a matter of legality it's really a matter of morality right the legality says what what hale did was wrong under the espionage act you don't reveal classified information no matter how horrific it is. Regardless of whether it's to an American journalist or not. And they'll and they'll sit there and claim, well, he could have revealed it to... Well, he didn't. He didn't. Coulda, woulda, shoulda, right? I mean, he, he fucking didn't. The reality is that he fucking didn't. He gave it to an American journalist who then looked at the information that he leaked and wrote articles about it so that the public is aware of how the military operates, so that we can kind of push back against some of this propaganda. That the American military is a force for good. They're not. They're not. They're not. Sorry, bubble burst, I know, to a lot of nationalistic people that might end up watching this and try to shit post in the comments. The American military is not the good guys. They never were. They never have been. And it's very likely that they never fucking will be. But the morality in this situation says that killing innocent civilians, especially brown civilians, and, and making them casualty of war, and just saying, oh, collateral damage, it happens when you're, when you're on a battlefield, is wrong. And they're not on a battlefield. They're in their home country. They're at try, trying to live their lives in peace, and they're getting drone bombed. You're, you're you're creating your own enemies at this point. So the question ends up being this, right? Whose side are you going to take? Are you going to take Daniel Everett Hale's side, who revealed American war crimes, who revealed the kill chain of a president that got the Nobel fucking Peace Prize for expanding American wars and championing capitalism to its utmost extreme? Or are you going to stand by the person that revealed that this person is not a good person? That's the question. Holly and Fred over on the Rockfins. Hello, how are you? Good to see you. Hashtag, Holly says, hashtag free Daniel Hale. I agree with that. Hell yes. Uh, Fred, thank you for posting that thrice song. Death from above. That's what it's called. Death from above. It's about, it's about drone operators, uh, and not knowing who you're killing. It's a fantastic fucking song. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm you know what I'm, what I might do at some point, uh, after some of the stress clears up is I do want to, I do want to do a rock fin and, and Odyssey exclusive, um, and just do a review of this album, play a couple of the songs in the album and just talk about the and talk about them. I want to do that with some some you know pieces of pop culture. I've mentioned this several times before. Uh, it is something that I want to do. It's a, it's just a matter of how much time I have in my day, uh, you know. So, but Death from Above by Thrice. Uh, thank you for posting that. Um, 
Fred also says, oopsies are not acceptable. Fucking Obama. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just a whoops. We blew up a wedding. Oh, who knew? That's so crazy. It looked like a looked like a terrorist camp. Oh, really? Did it? You can't tell the difference between a, 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 an Islamic wedding and a, and a terrorist camp. That makes you fucking racist. <laughs> it's completely ridiculous. But yes, Daniel Hale should be free. Absolutely should be free. Let's switch over to our second story of the day. Uh, Frito-Lay, you know, the, the Amer America's greatest snack company, uh, part of PepsiCo. I think I knew that, but wh whenever I read the article, I, I had like a, oh, okay, kind of moment. Uh the employees in, 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 in Topeka, Kansas, where one of their factories are, one of their larger factories are, are currently on strike uh, because there is a, a shortage in employees. Uh, and you're about to find out why there's a shortage of employees, because now the, the workers that are at this factory uh, had to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, uh, and they and they're not seeing anything in return for it. They pulled up all this overtime because there's staffing shortages. Uh, and why is there staffing shortage? Gee, I don't. I, I mean, what could it be? What could it be that could lead to these step? Is it just people don't want to work? Is it people are just so lazy they don't want to work? It's the handouts from the government that have come down. The people just don't want to work anymore. No, it's because minimum wage hasn't gone up in 10 fucking years. The government isn't doing anything to help the people. Corporations aren't doing anything to help the people. And there's and there's more uh, an upward transfer of wealth in our society. And that's pretty evident in the case of Frito-Lay, comma, PepsiCo. In 12 years, employees have seen a raise of 77 cents an hour. In twelve now, yeah, some some people may be like, well, you know, the company needs to make money. They have so many factories everywhere, and 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 then the CEO has to take care of himself too, and the upper management has to take care of themselves. What do you expect these companies to do? Well, Frito Lay uh, made eighteen point two billion dollars in revenue last year during a pandemic, because guess what? When people get stressed out or depressed or anxious or what have you. Snacking is something that they do. I do. I do it. I fucking definitely do it. I'm a big snacker, man. I put I put on a little bit of pudge because of the because of the extra snacking. But I will say that I have not snacked on any Frito Lay products because Trader Joe's and Aldi do not carry a lot of free Frito Lay products. And you know now I'm trying to snack healthier trying to eat more fruits, you know, like hummus, that sort of stuff. I'm trying to not be... Sweets are tough for me to kick. Anyway, not the point. The point is, 77 cent raise in 12 years. Meanwhile, during a pandemic, you made $18.2 billion, which, by the way, is half of the revenue of PepsiCo. So half of the revenue that this giant, even giant corporation made came from this giant corporation and they can't pay their employees uh, more than an additional 77 dollars uh, 77 cents an hour how is that possible well it's possible because there's an upward transfer of wealth it's possible because the working class in this country are treated like dog shit it's possible because Kansas is a right to work state and capitalists have convinced Americans that that's all they have the right to do is work. And whatever fucking pittance we give you is what we give you. Meanwhile, the price of shit's going to go up because that's what it does. That's how booms and busts work. Look, if you have an economic system where every so often it collapses destroying anybody that's in the middle or lower classes that have to then crawl their way back up to the top while the government then bails out 
using socialism because because in America there's socialism for corporations but not for people, which is what socialism is meant to be there for. Then yeah, ain't nobody gonna want to fucking work for your company, man, because that's what you represent. You represent the collapse of the working class, the manufactured collapse of the working class. The people that helped you earn that revenue are seeing barely anything of it. A fraction of a percent of it is all they get to see. 77 cents an hour is all you fucking gave when on when uh, during a pandemic you made 18.2 billion dollars. And then the article they talk about well, you know, during the pandemic for a short little while for a couple of weeks they were giving people um, you know, about about 20 bucks a day extra. They were giving people extra 20 bucks a day. So it was about 100 bucks a week for a couple of weeks. And that's what they think is enough? I mean, they're so out of touch. The, 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 the CEOs, the politicians, they're so out of touch with what's going on here. When the price of milk goes up from 350 to 450, they don't realize how big of a jump that is. And what that actually means for the American family, because they have so much wealth that a dollar jump in, in the price of milk is, you know, chump change. That It's fucking nothing. So, I mean, you know, so, so Kansas kind of looks at these strikes. Usually right wingers look at these strikes. Really, Democrats do it, too. They look at these strikes and they go, well, you know, this is why we have a work shortage. Oh, these lazy fucking... No, it's not... We don't have a work shortage. We don't have a labor shortage. We have a wage shortage. We have an income shortage. These fucking CEOs want to hoard their fucking wealth. That's why people don't want to fucking work for them. And you're going to see more of these strikes coming up. We're going back to that point. A hundred years ago, this was, we had, we had two decades, two, three decades of really, really strong labor actions. And we're, we're, we're veering in that direction again, which is good. But I hope that we can learn our lessons from the previous time we did this, which is that the state is going to resort to violence very quickly because that's what they do. When the strikers and the working class retaliate, they're gonna they're gonna label us as violent. So we gotta fight that kind of propaganda. And they're gonna try to use some Cold War tactics against us. Oh, the Russians have infiltrated the the strike. Oh, the Russians are what's causing this to oh, it's the communists here. They can't, you know. They're going to use some kind of boogeyman. And the fourth thing is, again, we'll likely win. If we can figure out how to do general strikes across the country, coordinated efforts, uh, whether it's citywide, whether it's statewide, what have you, general strikes with solidarity strikes, we'll likely win because we did it in the past. That's how we won before. 1934, we saw general strikes all across the country. The National Guard was called. They got violent. The radical socialists pushed back against them, defending themselves. And then in 1935, the Wagner Act was signed by FDR, whose administration basically equated them to terrorists. And he said, okay, well, they don't seem to be backing down from the violence. All right, let's give into some of these demands or else we're going to see this shit nonstop. So the Wagner Act got signed. It strengthened unions. It gave the working class people more collective bargaining powers. It actually legitimized the working class in this country. During the depression, people's lives were getting better because we had general strikes that pushed back against the government and they had they were forced into the legislation. Why? Because they were fucking scared of us. What's going on in Frito at Frito Lay and all the other thousands of strikes, thousands of strikes we've seen. Prove that.
And look, if you're one of these people that are against this stuff and they're like, oh, these people are just complaining. They don't no, Nobody wants to work anymore. Look, these people are not asking for too much. They're asking for a fair livable wage, a wage that they can, you know, they, that they can take home and, and not worry. How am I going to pay these bills? They want decent hours. They want to see their families. That's what they talk about. Hey, I want to see my family. I haven't seen my family in forever. One of the, one of the people that gave testimonials um, said, you know, I, I worked this 18 hour shift and I came home on 4th of July and I passed out and I didn't even hear the fireworks going off. I just slept. I didn't get time to spend with my family or my kids or anything. I was so exhausted that I passed out. That should not be how work operates. You should not just go to a job, come home, fall asleep, wake up, and then just go back to that job. That's not how life should be. But under a right-to-work state, under the, the, the capitalist idea of right-to-work, that's all they want. Fucking Andrew Carnegie, who, who's, who's championed in the city of Pittsburgh, where I'm from, that's what he wanted. He wanted, he literally said, I would love if my factories could just be, uh, would be operational nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because that's just constant production, constant profits for them. That's not fucking fair to the people that you're, that, that are helping you make that infinite profit. So in order to counter these strikes, Frito-Lay started using coach buses that they would bring in and, and uh, uh, you know, ship in temporary workers and scabs to, to cover the strike, right? But the problem is there weren't too many temporary workers and scabs coming in to, to work at Frito-Lay. There was maybe three or four people per, per bus, Um so, so, you know, the longer the strike goes, the more money they're going to end up losing. And, and, and I, want, I want more people to catch wind of what's going on with Frito-Lay because I think one of the ways that you can kind of get them to start, you know, talking to their employees and, and helping their employees get better wages is don't buy their shit. Stop buying Pepsi products. Stop buying Frito-Lay stuff. Buy something different. If you see Frito-Lay on the fucking logo of the bag, don't buy it. This is not just a Topeka, Kansas issue. Then it becomes a national issue. Like I said, I don't I don't buy Frito-Lay stuff very often. Um, every so often, I, I might buy a bag of chips or something like that because I'm on the road, and I'm, you know. But in this instance, I I I won't do that I'll go, I'll go to trader joe's and buy buy a bag of chips from there you know and enjoy a nice but probably a healthier snack there's other options now here's the thing there's local support for these strikers because the local community in, in, in Topeka has seen a lot of these sort of industries come in, right? There's there's a lot of factories. There's a lot of this sort of production stuff that's happening in those in the in these areas. And when they see that their neighbors and their friends and their family uh, are, are being treated this way, this this unfair way, where they're not reaping the benefits of the work that they're putting in, they're like, "Well, this is bullshit. We're going to support you guys in whatever way they can." So there's people that are. Um, helping feed the strikers, right? They'll bring them food. And uh, they also help set up a fund to, to pay their bills. And this is what's called solidarity, <laughs> which is a core tenet of how socialism operates, which is the core tenet of how the labor movement operated. In fact, whenever there were general strikes across the city, there, there was a lot of this sort of stuff. Right. The, the, the strike, the, uh, the 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 leaders of the strikes would would organize ways to to open up soup kitchens so that the strikers could get fed and, and kind of rotate in shifts. Right. When there was a massive general strike called in, in Seattle, um, uh, you know, they, they organized trash pickups. They organized delivering milk to houses so organized delivering oil to to the hospital so that they could keep the lights run, uh, lights on. 
And the National Guardsmen that were called by uh, the Democrat Mayor Ole Hansen, who was arguably as paranoid, if not more, than Richard Nixon, who was a Republican. So you can kind of see, hey, Republican Democrats still act the same fucking way because it's not about party lines. It's about it's a, it's about a way of life and, and what you believe in. Capitalism makes you fucking paranoid because it's it's all based on competition. You never know who's going to fucking stab you in the back to get that promotion that you're hardworking for. That's the mentality that these people live under. And it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican. But Ole Hansen called in the National Guard, set up, uh, you know, these military checkpoints across the city with Gatling guns and all this other shit. The National Guardsmen said they've never seen the city run more efficiently. Gee, no fucking shit. A city that's that it, 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 a city that kind of gives up the fact that we need to make a, a certain profit point and instead goes along the model of, hey, let's just make sure that we're taking care of each other. Run smoother when you have cooperation instead of competition as the driving force behind a society, the society operates better. Holy fucking shit. This is bad. Capitalism operates backwards. It, it operates backwards to logic. It is an antithetical economic system. Under capitalism, as you move up the ranks, you make more money for less work. Well, that's weird. Are... are isn't it preached that the harder you work, the more money you'll likely make? Well, that that's so weird. The more work you do, the lesser you're seen on the totem pole, the more you're producing. You're actually producing the thing that these companies are are, are selling to consumers, the less it less income you see. Well, that's fucking weird. It's also an invasion of privacy under capitalism. Work is used as a way to invade your privacy. The amount of people that will end up contacting me, right? I'll, I'll book people on shows, and I would record these shows, right? I would I would record them. And as a way to kind of entice more people to come through, I, the, one of the shows I used to produce, I would, uh, I would put up clips of them on the internet. So one or two bits, you know. If it was a headliner, I would use two or three. Something like that. So all in all, it's you, you, you get to see, um, including my performance, about four different comics in about a 20 minute video. Right. And, and it was cool. It was it was pretty nice. Um, and I would make sure the comics were kind of OK with with that. But then I would get contacted and say, hey, I'm applying for a new job. And when you search my name on YouTube, this clip comes up. Um, and I don't want people to see this clip. Can you like take me off of the, you know, the description, all that? And I would oblige by it. But part of that is because they didn't want people to see their comedy. They didn't they didn't want to see their private life. They don't want to see what they did outside the nine to five because it could affect the fact that they could get a job. How fair is that? If you're an accountant or a teacher or a, a factory worker or a designer, whatever. Whether you're a socialist, a communist, whether you're somebody that's into bondage, what difference does that make in doing that job? If at home you like BDSM, if at home you're a pot smoker, if at home you, you like to knock back a couple of brews, as long as the next day you wake up, show up to work and do you know, a, a, a damn good job as a designer, accountant, a teacher, what have you, what does that matter? What does it matter what you post on social media? If 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 you support Daniel Hale, for example, does that make you less shit, less efficient of an accountant? Does that make you a a a a a a a worse teacher? I would say that it probably makes you a better teacher because you're probably teaching these kids you know, true American history, not the propaganda bullshit that that the American education system wants you to learn. It boils down to compliance. That's what work is used as in capitalism. Work isn't used as a way to um, 
better society, right? We don't do these certain jobs in whatever way to like uplift people and to improve society and to better each other's lives. No, it it is compliance and control. You need this job to pay these bills to live your life. So the job becomes the central focal point. The employers have more control. So what do they do? They control every aspect of your life. Oh, your private life has something that we as a corporation don't like. Henceforth, we will either fire you or just not hire you. And because we're a corporation, we're allowed to be discriminatory in that way. In most instances, if you're if you believe a certain thing or support a certain thing, probably not affecting your job. The only thing that I think you should be on the lookout for is like vehement racism. Because if you're if you're a business and let's say you're a store owner and you hire somebody that is racist and a black person comes into the store and they like are super rude to them and don't really show them around or or make them feel unwelcome. Well, that's not doing their job properly. Their ideology has affected that. But in terms of socialism, in, ter in terms of being a communist, in terms of being a supporter of Julian Assange, how is that going to affect them? How is that going to affect somebody trying to buy some fucking candles? Being a shitty employer is what affects your business. That's why I'm saying, hey, if you're out there and you're a big fan of Lay's potato chips, do don't buy it anymore. Don't buy it until and and be public about it. Say, hey, I'm boycotting fucking Frito Lay and PepsiCo till they learn how to treat their employees properly. Don't let the corporations control your life in any way, shape, or form. That's what these strikes and that's what the labor movement is about. Let's pop over to some comments. Aram, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, Fred says, I've got 24 hours in my day. How many you got? <laughs> uh, oh, man. I snack on $1 bag of chips. Fred, what, what kind of bags or chips are you getting, Fred? kind of bags i'm curious to know what your snack routine is <laughs> uh let's see uh, every time somebody leaves a new comment it scrolls to the bottom on rockfin it, it it's it's a little difficult to keep track of all of them so sorry if this, this part's just a wee bit awkward um holly says burger king employees made a we all quit video in lincoln nebraska yeah it's a wage short like you say it's a wage shortage yeah that's awesome I hope they articulated the fact that they fucking aren't getting paid enough and are and are uh, they 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 know their value as people and it's not fucking seven twenty five an hour with zero fucking benefits. Uh oh, here's a, a, I like this ARM. Uh, do monthly targeted boycotts of major corporations. Say start with Exxon Mobil, maybe even attach a uh, a target price for gas. Uh, peg. Peg return to patronage only after ExxonMobil drops their gas to $2 per gallon or drivers will go across the street, down the block, or go across town. That's not a bad idea. Tar targeted targeted boycotts of corporations would be um, would be would be a very, very good idea. And it would again it would hit them to, to the only fucking thing that matters, which is their bottom fucking line. Uh Aram also says that consumers have power to create a culture of business being responsive to people's interests, meaning the masses, people who shed their behaviors, shed the behaviors of peasants. Yeah, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and again, that's that's also another way when consumers push back in this way. That's another way that the working class is showing its power. That's another way the working class is saying, hey, you're not in control of this. Or you shouldn't be. And the propaganda would suggest, you know, oh, you're you're being this, you're being that, right? You're being you're you're being confrontational. You're not being agreeable, which is something else that corporations look for. Are you agreeable? Are are you are are you going to just listen to what we say 
are you going to look at our corporate policy and criticize it when we when we start stripping freedoms away when we have a specific dress code that's another thing i never understood about working in these sort of corporate settings is like there are certain uh there are certain, certain jobs, I guess, that need a, a particular type of attire. But if you're working in an office and you're not really seeing, you know, who can express yourself the way you want to express yourself. You know, don't show up naked or, or whatever. Like, but, you know, if you want to fucking wear a graphic tee with with Vader on it, then not go for it. Those environments to me were were a lot easier to work with. Uh, Gene points out something interesting. Weird, man. I just had someone try to link my Rockfin account to to Google link. Then my internet was down for a couple hours. Strange shit. That is very strange, Gene. Um, you know, I've been dealing with some uh, odd um, odd internet things, you know, and, and this sounds like a very privileged problem, and I and I recognize that it is. But, like, our Hulu was down on our TV, and, and it kept saying, like, the internet was out, but it wasn't. So, I mean, we tried everything, and it just seemed like 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 hulu was down but like everybody else like my sister lives in maryland and we contacted her and she was like everything works fine on our tv so yeah it's 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 odd when stuff like that happens um sometimes like i'll find that my internet is actually is slower for some reason uh like if i'm looking at certain articles it's it's it, it, it runs slower it is weird it is weird i will admit that it is very strange boycott frito Lay, folks don't buy those chips Tell them to treat their fucking workers properly. Your your fucking CEO doesn't need a second helicopter or another yacht. All right, our final story for the day is about Cornell West. I had to print out his letter, <laughs> by the way, um, and I and I'm still gonna have a hard time reading it, not because I'm I'm bad at reading out loud. I I, I will let, let me let me preface this whole section with this. I have an insecurity about reading out loud, um, because when I I'm I'm a I'm a bad reader. Period. Like I, I it, it it it's it's harder for me to like read through some stuff sometimes. Uh, it, like that's why I'm it's harder for me to read through books because I keep going back and reading over some things and trying to like okay how does this phrase what's going on, you know. Uh, but when I was in, in middle school, I used to get made fun of a lot because I, I was I wasn't particularly a strong reader, but I also like was slow. I was a, I'm, I'm a slow reader. I know that about myself, too. Uh, so sometimes like. I, I my, my mind will start wandering a little bit and then my eyes will start wandering a little bit and I'll skip a couple words and then I'll be like, wait, this doesn't make sense. And I would have to go back and read it. So like. You know, teachers and classmates used to make fun of me for it. So, th so this is like part of an insecurity that I have that I just need to fucking get over. Um, but I had to print out the letter because I downloaded it from Twitter. But the image is small. And when I zoom in, it gets super fuzzy. Uh, so I just was like, fuck it. I'll print it out. I'll go old school. I'll go I'll go brick and mortar on this song, bitch. And uh, and I'll, uh, I'll 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 read this. I'll read this bad boy out loud. So it was it was all over Twitter. It's also in on radindymedia.com. Uh if you go 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 check them out for your uh for your independent news uh sources. I lost the word I, I had in my head. Okay. Uh but that's that's where that's where I first saw it today was Rad Indie Media, and then I saw it on Twitter. And a bunch of people were talking about it. Uh so let's get into this letter. And, and let's kind of just break down what happened, because the reason why he left is, as you can see in the little title card here, is he left Harvard over their views on Palestine. So this is, this is from June 30th. Uh, and, and it starts. He's such a fucking polite dude. Right. It, it starts with, I hope and pray you and your family are well. This summer is a scorcher. You ain't lying there, Dr. West. You are not lying there. It is a hot fucking summer. It was a hot summer last year, but I, I feel like this summer is way hotter. Scorcher, good word. That's that's the word to describe the summertime. Especially this summertime. It's not just hot, it's a scorcher. Here's my brief and candid letter of resignation. So here we go. Uh, how sad it is to see our beloved Harvard Divinity School 
in such decline and decay. What a fucking start to the letter, right? Holy shit. Such decline and decay. Damn, dude. This man knows how to write a fucking letter. The disarray of a scattered curriculum, the disenchantment of talented yet differential faculty, and the disorientation of pr uh, precious student loom, students loom large. Now, we were in a pandemic year. I, I, I admit to that. But I have family and friends in academia, and I will say that even before the, the pandemic, um, they were having a hard time with uh, administration. You know, as he points out, scattered cur curriculums, you know, the, the talented yet differential faculty. Yeah, when, when the administration comes down on you for, for how you're teaching and what you're teaching and says you can't talk about certain topics, certain subjects, and that happens long enough, you get beaten down. I had a professor when I was in college. His name was George Founds. He was fucking phenomenal and really was one of the people that taught me how to think critically. Uh, okay, that that's the key there, is he taught me how to think critically. And as an 18 to 22-year-old, I mean, you th th that's the time to really fucking develop those skills. Asking the right questions, how to problem solve properly, how to be creative about your problem solving, how to use the creative process in various aspects of your life. The design department didn't particularly care for his method of teaching and his hands-on projects. Um, and they were intensive projects. There was, there was a lot to consider in what he was giving us. Um, but again, that's part of the creative process. It's part of critical thinking, right? And they were trying to oust him. You know, they would kind of shit on him, do these, oh, we can't really approve this. Why don't you just teach him how to use the software? You know, and software is one thing when it comes to graphic design. I, I'm, I won't deny that. But really, it's the way you think. It's the way you solve the problem. Um, a creative solution to the problem is, is really what differentiates you, especially in a creative field. But by the end of it, he was just burnt out. We were the last class he taught. And there were times where I could tell George was just exhausted from dealing with the bureaucracy at the school. Um, dealing with, the, you know, the upper level academics that didn't really give a shit about any of this stuff. About sharing his knowledge with this next generation. They just wanted him to hit the curriculum. Let's go. Do this, do this, do this. But he was teaching us how to think. That's far more important than something on a curriculum. Anyway, going on with the letter. When I arrived four years ago with a salary less than what I received 15 years earlier with no tenure status after being a university professor at Harvard and Princeton, I hoped and prayed I could still end my career with some semblance of intellectual intens intensity and personal respect. How wrong I was. Damn, dude. Like, he fucking hits hard with these. With a few glorious and glaring excep exceptions, the shadow of Jim Crow cast in its new glittering form of exp uh, new glittering form expressed in the language of superficial diversity. All my courses were subsumed under Afro-American religious studies, including those on existentialism, American democracy, and the conduct of life. No possible summer salary along, alongside the lowest increase possible every year. Yet, I delivered two convocation addresses and one commencement speech in four years. I was promised a year sabbatical, but could only take one semester in practice. And to witness a faculty enthusiastically support a candidate for tenure, then timidly defer to rejection based on Harvard's administration's hostility to the Palestinian cause was disgusting. So he supported Palestinians and they rejected him. They wouldn't offer him the tenure. We all knew the 
mendacious reasons. They, if Fred, Fred, if you're still watching, that's that's a big that's a big dollar word right there. Mendacious. We all knew the mendacious reasons given had nothing to do with academic standards. When my committee recommended a 10-year review, also rejected by the Harvard administration, I knew my academic achievements and student teaching meant far less than their potential, uh, their political pre pre prejudices. Even my good friends in the Afro-American and African Studies Department were paralyzed given to their close relationship with the, to the administration. And after teaching extra courses, including five courses in one year, this silence continued. When the announcement of the death of my beloved mother appeared in the regular newsletter, I, re I received two public replies just as uh, of that my colleague, Dr. Uh, Jacqueline Olga Cook Rivers, who received none when her blessed mother died. Which is just shitty. You know, like when you have a death in the family and you don't hear anything from any of your people, like super fucking shitty. Even if you didn't, you know, even if I don't know that person very well, I, I'll, I'll at least say I'm sorry for your loss because I am. It fucking sucks losing somebody. If you've lost anybody in your life, you know what that pain feels like. And just to say, Man, I'm so sorry you're going through this, is it does a lot. Lost my place. Okay. Any ordinary announcements about a lecture, award, or professional advancement re receives about 20 replies. This kind of narcissistic academic professionalism, cowardly deference to the anti uh, to the anti Palestinian prejudices of the Harvard administration and indifference to my mother's death constitute an intellectual and spiritual bankruptcy to uh, of deep debts depths fuck man uh, in my case a serious commit commitment to veritas requires resignation with precious memories but absolutely no regrets that's a fucking i mean he slammed him hard you you got two fucking replies. One of your colleagues got none. And everybody stays silent because you got you you got rejected from tenure because you support the Palestinian struggle, who are living under apartheid, who are living under a military theocratic uh, uh, oppressive regime right now. And that's what it is. This again, I, I mean I, I I released a video earlier this week for uh, and I and I hope some folks will go check it out uh, about how the Israel lobby controls narratives, especially in academia, in, in, in the collegiate level. They go after college students, but they also, I mean, they're, they're going after professors. They say that Harvard didn't say a, a goddamn thing. My God. How fucking petty does a university need to be that you can't send a I'm so sorry you're going through this because you lost your mother. And I, I, I doubt that Cornell West will watch this, but, you know, Dr. West, I'm so sorry you had to go through a, a, a tragedy like that. I can't I can't even fucking imagine the pain of losing your mother. And the administration can't even say that because he supports Palestinians. That should show you how deep and insidious the fucking Israel lobby is. That should show you how the, the root of problems in academia. I, I, I don't know what Cornell West is going to do next. Um, I'm excited to see what happens next. I think he is an important voice uh, of our generation. Um, you know, I, I disagreed with him on, on, on electoral politics, um, and I probably will continue to disagree with him on electoral politics. Uh, but that's okay, because you know what? It, uh, Cornell West is one of those people that, res that you can have a respectful disagreement with.
administrative members of, of, of Harvard, the Israel lobby, members of the Israel lobby, you can't have a respectful disagreement with. Because they'll block you out. They'll silence you. They'll try to push you out. And you're left with no other recourse except to resign. Again, his views on Palestine, does that make him an effective professor or not? I would wager to bet that it makes him a better professor because it shows that he, he has humanity in his heart. That he understands what this conflict is about. Understands where pain and trauma come from and possibly how to alleviate that. And isn't that what the next generation needs to learn the cause and effects of trauma and how to prevent it and how to reduce that, how to reduce pain in the world. That makes him a far more effective fucking teacher than someone that recites fucking uh, intelligence community talking points or what the Israel lobby wants them to say. Who fucking cares what a bunch of moneyed assholes have to say? I don't. Because they don't have any beliefs. They have a they have a, a bank account. That's it. Cornell West has beliefs that he's stuck by. And and because he's stuck by his beliefs, he was punished by have, by being forced to resign. That is unfair. And that shows you how deeply, deeply fucking rot rotted this system is. Let's look at your comments. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fred says, temps were so high by me. Uh, my lettuce bolted at the end of May. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, Holly points out, teaching critical thinking is education. Uh, uh, agreed. Agreed. I, I think that should be the core tenant of any sort of education. Uh, Brother West is so articulate. He, I, I, I honestly think like he is. There's so much. There, there is anger behind what he's saying in his letter, but it's so beautifully fucking written. You're just like, who cares? I don't, I don't care how angry you are. This is fucking. This is poetry is what you, your resignation letter is. Poetry, sir, is what it is. Um. Aram asks, how much deeper than bankruptcy can intellect be? <laughs> Edit that shit down, brother West. Yeah, it should. I honestly, if this was me, I would have just I, it would have just been like, here's my here's my candid and short resignation letter. Eat a dick. Goodbye. <laughs> like, <laughs> but he wait, wait, it's just so beautiful, you know. Holly points out we have the same respectful disagreement with Brother West. Yes. I I um I was disappointed to see him, uh, you know, putting put, putting support behind Biden, knowing full well what Biden was. Um, but the way he articulated his point, I was like, I understand where you're coming from, but I but I disagree with with the with, with the actions you're taking. Um, I, I think your actions and, and your reasoning don't line up, in my opinion. Uh, and, 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 you know, I, I think that's how you, that that's okay. You're, you should be able to respectfully disagree with, uh, with people that you risk, that you, uh, respect and the people that you, uh, whose opinions you value. You shouldn't just be a yes man all the time. If you are, then, you know, like you you, you don't have beliefs that you have formed yourself. You're, you're just parroting other people's beliefs and, or at least that's the way I see it. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Um, you know, but to, to to wrap this segment up, I I hope that uh, Doctor West, it, it, the next chapter of his life, is uh, one where he can find uh, solace in his intellect, where where people won't judge him or ostracize him for who he is, because nobody at regardless of age, gender, race, creed, color, nobody should go through that. Nobody should go through that kind of ostracization. 
All right. Uh, we're going to wrap up today's stream. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, as always, if you've enjoyed this stream today, please make sure you hit the like button. Uh, please make sure that you share this out with as many people as you possibly can. And please make sure that you are still subscribed to the page, whether it's Rockfin, uh, Odyssey, uh, whether you listen to the audio version of this. Uh, please make sure you're subscribed, especially if you're watching this on YouTube and Facebook. D do make sure that you're still following my page because they will unsubscribe people and uh, not send notifications and all that sort of stuff. Uh, if you want to make a donation, become a sustaining member, get a whole bunch of bonus content sent to you by email once a month, uh, join my, uh, you, you can become a sustaining member or make a one-time donation over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate. If you're watching on, on Odyssey, you can support the channel by by um, using library credits or now they have uh, they have a dollar donation uh, uh, a a a active on my channel. So that's pretty awesome. If you're on Rockfin, leave tips. Uh, my Rockfin account is still currently a little wonky. I'm still trying to sort that out. Uh, hopefully that'll be taken care of soon. But I encourage you guys to leave tips on there um, that I will eventually uh, be able to get to get. Uh, and, uh, if you want to receive weekly emails from me, uh, that gives you a whole list of my videos and podcasts that I've released throughout the week, um, plus essays, tour dates, virtual shows, uh, other interviews and podcasts that I've done, uh, join my email list at krishmohanhaha.substack.com, uh, that, like I said, it goes out once a week and it's totally free. I've got live shows coming up, guys. Live shows! Live shows are coming back. Uh, very excited about it. I'm going to be doing shows around the Pittsburgh area, in Pittsburgh itself. Uh, I'm going to be in Cleveland, Baltimore, um, Little Rock. Uh, I just confirmed dates for Williamsport and Hanover, Pennsylvania. I'm working on dates for, for Louisville, for Minneapolis, for Chicago, uh, Chattanooga, Huntsville, Alabama, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, working on uh, dates for a uh, place like Des Moines, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm do I'm not doing the level of touring that I did before, but you know, every, every couple weekends, I'll, I want to get out there, work on this new show, uh, that I'm pretty, pretty dang excited about. So, uh, all the dates, ticket information is right up on my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, and if you want to be one of the first people to see this brand new show that I am uh, going to be working out on the road, if you want to see the very first version of it, July 30th, I'm doing a virtual show uh, where I'm just running through the whole show. Uh, so if that is something that you're interested in, grab tickets for that virtual show. You can be anywhere in, in the world and see this show. So, uh, yeah, so that's happening, which I'm very excited about. Uh, but till then, till tomorrow, I'll be back with a whole new stream. Uh, and, uh, three new topics, probably th th two or three new topics, uh, same bat time, same bat channel, no bat money, uh, at, uh, 4 30 PM Eastern. Um, uh, I hope to see you guys there. Thank you guys for, for hanging out, leaving comments, Fred, Holly, Aram, Gene, you guys are, you guys are awesome. Uh, and, uh, we will see you guys again soon. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we'll see you on the road.